Aloha, 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 kama aina. I am Naka Nathaniel, editor at large at Civil Beat, and I am joined by Kirsten Downey, who is a reporter who did an amazing series about Prince Jonah Kuhio Kalaniane Ole last year. And we are here to talk a little bit more about the prince and the remarkable impact that he had on Hawaii. It's such an amazing series, and you wonder where to start, but let's start with Kauai, where he was from. Well, that's true, but let me first say thank you for saying aloha, aloha, kama aina, <laughs> because that was how uh, Prince Kuhio always opened his speeches. It was a way to be very inclusive to uh, Hawaiians, no matter how, how they had arrived here. Uh, it brought the whole group together and made him many friends. Yeah. Well, he was such a remarkable you know, figure, and it's that's why we celebrate, you know, his uh, his birthday. That's right. That's right. Um, well, it's very interesting that he was born in Kauai, because you know his mother wasn't living on Kauai. Um, it was a sort of a strategic decision the family made. Um, Kauai was more their ancestral homeland. Um, his uh, he uh, was directly descended from the great uh, king Kaumualii of Kauai, and Kaumualii is unique among all the chiefs of Hawaii in that he was the only one that Kamehameha never conquered. Um, he did negotiate with him. He, in a sense, um, submitted to Kamehameha, but he did it, and there was no bloodshed on Kauai during uh, Kamehameha's life. Um, Kaumoli was also greatly respected. He married Kahumanu, who was Kamehameha's widow, and Kaumali actually sort of ended up becoming the king of Hawaii himself. Um, so this was a very important descent that Kuhio had, separate from the Kamehameha line, who have been the, ro the, the rulers in Hawaii. Um, when Kamehameha, when um, Kuhio, Kuhio's uh, mother decided to go to Kauai to give birth to her son, she went to a very famous temple compound near Koloa. Uh, now you, we know it as Prince Kuhio Park, um, but you can even see the foundation of the hale where Kuhio was born. Yeah, it's remarkable that yes. he was from Kauai. And then it, the Hawaii that he grew up in, though, was very different from the Kauai that his uh, just two or three generations before him. That's right. Lived in. Well, you know, just a few generations before, it was uh, an economy based on fishing, farming, sort of all the agricultural pursuits that had supported and nurtured Hawaiians for many centuries. Um, but the advent of outsiders changed life in Hawaii a lot. The economy changed, and it became very... Um, profitable to sell things to newcomers, mm -hmm. and that became a very busy line of business. So what had been a very rural population was becoming more urban, because where the ships landed was where you could go to sell wares, or food, or whatever you wanted to sell. And so Hawaii was changing. That meant there was had been abandonment of a lot of the rural areas, and an urbanization that was also causing disease to flourish. Um, uh, there had been times in Hawaiian history that Hawaii prospered that in that era, uh, along with some um, environmental degradation that happened. It also brought money, you know, selling sandalwood, supplying whalers, all those things have been prosperous. But the year that Kuhio was born, the whaling industry was dying. So what had been a big source of employ employment and the underlying economy was disappearing, and there was a search for a new source of economic sustenance, and that's how the sugar plantations right. took root. Right, and he would get involved, and we'll talk a little bit later on about yes. his involvement with the uh, with the sugar industry. Yes. So the Hawaii that he grew up in, though, was you know very you know not only economically but politically, it was also in the midst of a great change. Well, it was a monarchy, um, and proud of being a monarchy. Um, and in fact, he was born. Uh, his own his, his his aunt was Queen Kapiolani, the wife of King Kalakaua, and she was so aware of his birth that she recorded his birth in her personal Bible. Okay, so from the beginning, he he was born as part of royalty, and he was raised as royalty, um, and he until. Uh, the 1890s believed he would be a prince and maybe even possibly a king of Hawaii. Right. And he was sent away to be schooled in he was, California. He was sent away in the way that 
you know, aspiring monarchs have always been raised. He got a good education here in the islands. Um, they were very deliberate in having him learn a little bit, having him spend a few years uh, associated with the Iolani school, which would be the Episcopalians, and then a few years at Punahou, which meant that he was associated with the congregation. Yeah. But then they sent him to a military academy in in uh, California, where he learned how to march and be prepared to be a soldier, which is what most um, rulers had to do, is to be prepared to fight. Right. And in fact, he did have to fight, as it turned out. Yeah. And so he... Yeah, the end of the Hawaiian kingdom happened when he was a young man. Yes, he was actually at school in London, and he thought he was going to be going to an elite military school in Germany to learn more about the military arts. And instead, his um, his his uh, adopted uncle, uh, Kalakaua, died, and his aunt, Queen Kapiolani, had to ask him to please come back as soon as possible. Um Kalakaua's, uh, Kalakaua was replaced on the throne by his sister, mm. Queen Liliuokalani, um, and she was not as closely related to Kuhio as, of course, Kapiolani had been right. because she was his aunt. Um, but he was close to her, and when the monarchy was overthrown, he was enraged about it and active in the overthrow. Unfortunately, the overthrow was unsuccessful. The overthrow, the attempt to overthrow the overthrow right. was unsuccessful. Um, he was captured. He was imprisoned for a year at hard labor in Oahu jail. And I just, how extraordinary that is. Someone who had been raised to be a prince ends up at, at in sentenced to hard labor in right. a in a jail um, for trying to defend his right to right. rule his own country. Yeah, that it's was the curious thing, yeah, yes. where it was, you know, he was part of an overthrow of an overthrow. Yes. Yeah, that, yes. that's one of these things that's a little bit hard to wrap your head around. It is, it yeah. is, but what an extraordinary change in your life conditions. And this is one of the things that's really amazing about him. Um, you know, throughout history, um, deposed monarchs have slunk away, or maybe they tried to raise an army to get their 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 throne back. Um, on some level, though, Kuhio realized that what had happened couldn't be changed, and what he had was this amazing practice practicality. Right. How do you make the best of a bad situation? And that's kind of his genius. Yeah. And so he ended up leaving Hawaii after that. He did. And well, said, he was, I'm never coming he, back. He was, he was obviously a, yeah. a bit, yeah. you know, yeah. enraged and left and said and told people he was never coming back. He had married a very beautiful woman, Elizabeth Kahanu, and they and he had inherited some money when his aunt, Queen Kapiolani, died. Um, and so he had some money to travel. And they set off across, really, on this global uh, jaunt. Um, he went everywhere. And we see him in the news accounts showing up the Paris Exposition. He's a man about town in San Francisco. He heads down and does a safari down in Africa. And that's where he gets actually caught up in a war. He actually ends up getting dragged into the Boer War in South Africa and serves on the side of the British against yeah. the Boers. Yeah, and he's a social Adonis of Hawaii. Yes, right. Yeah. So, yes, and he does, and he, he, he fights with, you know, uh, in a way that it, uh, attracts favorable attention. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's something about him, no matter how bad the circumstances are, he comes out and is is is... is very successfully, and he made a few friends in South Africa that were really interesting. Um, and in fact, there's accounts from that time that he had been so upset about what had happened in Hawaii, and he thought he'd never come back. But some people who were sort of also sort of practitioners, of sort of a real politic, said, you know, you're doing this, but aren't you abandoning your own people? And he took that on board, and he came back to Hawaii. Yeah, it was very poignant. It was like, you have an obligation to your people. And this yes. was the moment in South Africa where he decided to return. To come back, to come yeah. back. And then he did a really remarkable thing. He came back to Hawaii, and he ran for the U.S. Congress. Right. Now, but he was running for Congress against some of his relatives. There yes, was a he lot was. of back yes, he and was. forth well, on Well, there was a real, well, first of all, it was very interesting. The Hawaiians became very interested in the election process and became very engaged um, in it. So, and there were three separate parties, all all compelling in their own ways. Um, the Republican Party, which was the party in power, and of course the party that had won the Civil War. Right. So there was a long, a long sense that that had been 
the good people in the Civil War, and so there, and and also was the party of the wealthy. Right. Um, so there was a very strong Republican Party here. Um, the Democratic Party uh, had a, a good social justice tradition of its own, too, and his own brother, David Kawananakoa, became uh, the um, the leader of the Democratic Party. Um, and then, of course, there was another candidate named Robert Wilcox, mm. a Hawaiian, Robert mm. Wilcox, um, and he became the uh, standard bearer of the Home Rule Party. Right. And their motto was, Hawaii for Hawaiians. Right. That was a very popular appeal to Hawaiians. So he had a lot to sort of navigate and overcome. Initially, he was part of the Home Rule Party, but he decided at some point that there was too much uh, what he considered racist rhetoric mm -hmm. happening in the in the Home Rule Party, and he felt he would be more comfortable and more successful in the Republican Party. So he joined the Republican Party, which is kind of hard for people in Hawaii to imagine now today right. because it's such a democratic right. party. But at that time, that was a kind of a savvy political move. And when he got elected by a, a huge margin as the U.S. congressman from Hawaii, he joined the Republican Party, and that was the power party in, in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. That was very significant. Uh, move that he made, um, because as a congressman from a territory, he had the right to participate in all the events in Congress, but no vote. No vote. No right. vote. He had to make friends to get things done. So the D.C. that he ended up going to was, it's a segregated city. A segregated and city with, a, this, with yeah. a very cruel racist past, and he's a brown-skinned man who has to make his way in a white-dominated city. Um, it was not always easy, um, and in fact, he had to use his famous brawling skills at a few points to defend his rights. At one point, he was uh, he went in to get a, a, a shave and a haircut at the Capitol barber shop, and someone and the barber said he wouldn't cut his hair, and for racial reasons. Right. And Kuhio put up his dukes, threw the guy out. The guy landed on the ground. And after that, he got excellent haircuts at the barbershop. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard way to do that, you know. So, so he was part of, you know, we had talked a little bit about, you know, his role in, in kind of moving Hawaii forward. And one of the things that, obviously, the monarchy that he grew up in and trying to, you know, switch, you know, Hawaii to more of a democratic, you know, institution where... Yeah, the system that was in place was based more on self-rule yes. for the individual. So that was one of the things that he you know, remarkably introduced was the county system that we right. now have here in Hawaii. Right. Well, you know, um, in Hawaii, power has always been highly centralized. Um, whoever was the ruling chief had power of life or death over everyone in his domain. Uh, and so from the very beginning, there was a, uh, a very sort of a long tradition that you look to a monarch, you look to a leader, you hope they do right by you. You might be able to get rid of them if they don't, but they're also very skilled warriors, so you might not be successful if you try to protest. So there was a long tradition of sort of accepting centralized government. So when the... Um, as Hawaii developed into a monarchy, um, there were more limitations put on that, um, you might say, the complete, uh, absolute monarchy, um, sort of through new constitutional rules and limitations. Um, but when Hawaii became a territory and a democracy, it needed a whole new form of government that was new to people in Hawaii. Um, and also a form of government that a lot of people in a power in Hawaii didn't really like. People in Hawaii, a lot of people who govern in Hawaii like that centralized power. They don't want to give up power to others. Um, and so one of the things that Kuhio did was he got through Congress uh, legislation that allowed Hawaii to establish self-government for the first time. So that's why we have our county governments. That's why we have councils in all our islands and right. why we have elected mayors. These were things that had to be created by legislation in Congress. And by this time, the sugar planters were really pretty powerful in Hawaii, and they didn't really like that idea at first. Um, and in fact, they probably never liked that idea very right. well. But it was a very important thing that he did to gradually build support and create 
the system that we have that allows people to have more control over the islands where they live. Right, right. Not everything being controlled by the yes. powers that be in Honolulu. That's right. And he had to win uh, legislation in U.S. Congress to make right. that happen. Yeah, and this, yeah, because Hawaii was a territory, and everything you know was controlled by, you know, by the folks in D.C. And yes. so, one of the things that, you know, the and you just talked about this it was one of his remarkable challenges was dealing with the sugar trusts that existed here in Hawaii at the time that they had taken over, you know, for the whaling industry and, and had become immensely rich. Right. And that was one of the things that they had to negotiate so many of the tariffs and, you know, but also the living conditions for many of the people that worked on those sugar plantations was something that was a great concern to Prince Well, well this was a real, this was a real issue. They wanted to protect, um, they wanted to give uh, tariff protections to Hawaiian sugar to make sure that it would be imported at, in the most advantageous financial rates um, because it was the source of a lot of the economic the economy here in Hawaii, um, not just the sugar planters making money, but also selling things to the sugar planters and equipment and 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 food being supplied to the, the growing numbers of people working at the plantations. And of course, that meant that the population here in Hawaii was changing radically too. The Hawaiians were dying out very quickly. Um, uh, they didn't have resistance to a lot of the imported diseases um, that came in, and there were not enough Hawaiians to do this work. Um, and the sugar planters wanted to bring in new workers that they could pay less money. So they went around the world recruiting people, desperate people from around the world, who were willing to come here for a better life. Um, but it meant that the population of Hawaii was changing very radically. When Kuhio was born, by far, the population was only Hawaiian, and by the time he died, Hawaiians were a minority. Right, right. And that was one of the things, though, that, you know, he had to take on the sugar trust. You know, that, yes. that was one of the way that the politics was working in Hawaii at the time was that you know, the sugar trusts really were the ones that were controlling, you know, most of the levers. And he had to fight against them, right. especially for the governorship. You know, the governor at the time, you know, Governor Freer, was seen as being a very powerful figure right. that was in the pocket of the, it, the sugar. It, it was companies. a re he had to do. It was a really difficult balancing act mm -hmm. because every congressman has to protect the local economy of the right. place that he represents because that's how people get their food. Yeah. That's how people live. Uh, on the other hand, he had to deal with the indignity of dealing with people that often didn't treat him well. Sometimes actually treated him with contempt, and he navigated this as well as he could. Um, sometimes he would speak out, but he was an an amazingly diplomatic person. You might say he was a consummate diplomat. Yeah. Um, he'd been raised to be a diplomat, and he navigated that very well, but you can see in his personal letters with great frustration at times. Yeah. So he was a remarkable Democrat, uh, diplomat, but at the same time, you know, he had also this military background. Yeah. And that's one of the things that he identified pretty early on was that even though the United States had annexed uh, Hawaii, they had still yet to put into effect the right. mechanisms that they right. wanted to. Well, um, Kuhio had traveled all over the world. He'd been a prince negotiating and talking to his equals who were other world leaders. He was very knowledgeable about global politics. Um, and he became very worried about what the intentions of the Japanese were to Hawaii. Um, the United States had uh, annexed Hawaii, as you say, and they had taken control of the land that would later become Pearl Harbor, but they had never done anything to fortify it. Well, starting as early as 1905, um, Kuhio was very worried that Japan was going to try to invade Hawaii and annex it, which they were doing with a lot of other Asian countries, and he, and in some cases with great cruelty, and he was worried that they would try to do that in Hawaii as well. So he lobbied very hard to fortify Pearl Harbor and fought very hard for funding to um, all kinds of funding to build Pearl Harbor into what it became, which was the fortress of the Pacific. Um, 
one of the ways he did this was bringing almost all the lawmakers in Congress <laughs> right. here on trips to visit and see. It's remarkable and he, photos. Of, right. Yeah. And, and he took them to Pearl Harbor and he showed them what it could be, that it was a fabulous natural harbor, but that it was completely unfortified. And given uh, the awareness that people were having um, of... Um, rising global tensions, which of course led first to World War One, and then even more catastrophically to World War II, um, the congressman he brought got the message, and they funded the fortification of Pearl Harbor. Now, of course, we view that with some mixed emotions right. today. Um, the military, the U.S. military has done a great many wrong things here and injured our environment in really you know, terrifying ways, um, but um, we haven't been successfully invaded yet. Right. <laughs> so what is the, you know, his, you know, introducing of all these you know, different pieces, you know, one of the most remarkable ones that we experience today, or we're supposed to have experienced today, is the Hawaiian Homelands Project. And it's one of these, uh, he had you had mentioned that you know, the Hawaii that he was born into, you know, the number of Hawaiians had died off quite quickly, and there was a great sense of a loss of community. And so he, you know, felt himself personally tasked to try and revitalize the right. Hawaiian community. How did he? Right. Well, a lot of the traditional Hawaiian villages had been abandoned by now, and a lot of Hawaiians had been pressed into these cities where there were jobs, but where the conditions were very poor, where they were living on very little money, even sometimes starving. Um, and all the old ways of supporting themselves had been taken away. What he wanted to do is restore Hawaiians to the land, to give them land back. And so what he did is uh, came up with the idea of creating the Hawaiian homelands with lands that would be guaranteed to be permanent residences for Hawaiians. He viewed these as places that would be small farms, um, where people could grow their own produce, that have livestock, support themselves, have a home, and get to live in the ways that Hawaiians had happily lived in the past. Um, this was a great vision, and but a very challenging one to try to make happen. Um, in the process of negotiating these the, for the Hawaiian homelands, which he did successfully succeed in getting this legislation through Congress, he had to accept that some of the lands had problems. They were too dry. They didn't have water. They needed to have a really uh, modern irrigation system that would bring water to the lands. Unfortunately, at this point, he was in his early 50s. He'd had a hard life, um, and his heart and his lungs were giving out. Um, it was his dream that he would retire to Hawaii and actually become the director of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, and that he would... Um, get these lands irrigated and get as many Hawaiians onto wonderful right. homes as could possibly be done. Um, but he served in Congress for 10, ye 10 terms. So 20 years he was a U.S. congressman. And it wasn't easy living in D.C. in those years. The right. weather was very bad, horrible in the summer, miserable in the winter. And he, 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 he had taken blows to his body. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it would take him two weeks to get back and forth. You it know, was just between, traveling yeah. back and forth was, was grueling. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, he died before he was able to realize his dream of the great thing that Hawaiian homelands could and should be, and that we still struggle, struggle to try to yeah. achieve today. So he died in 1922, and you know, over the course of his life, you know, there was a dramatic change in Hawaii. And you just mentioned, you know, what would have you know happened in Hawaii if he had been in, alive for a little bit longer. Yes, well, I think he probably would have gotten a lot money to build a lot better infrastructure in the Hawaiian homelands. I think he would have done that for sure, and yeah. that's never been achieved by anyone else since. So the remarkable thing about, you know, and he's been dead for, you know, 100 years, is that really has never been another significant Native Hawaiian political leader that's come in his footsteps. Well, I'd really say of the two Hawaiians who really changed Hawaii, I'd say, I'd identify, well, three, I'd say, Kamehameha, Ka'umualii, mm -hmm. and Kuhio. 
Yeah. Yeah. It, and no one else has stepped into those footsteps. Well, the population changed. And democracy means that people vote for people that they feel more closely personally allied with. And Hawaii's leadership has changed over the years. Um, only more recently have the, has the Hawaiian population grown and expanded enough that they've become a more important power block again, um, sort of electorally. Um, and I uh, and so I, I think the time is at hand for more Hawaiian lawmakers to assume even more power. So one of the remarkable things uh, you mentioned this earlier about you know, Prince Kuhio was the pragmatic tack that he took and trying to figure out ways to work with you know, the real politic of the time. Mm-hmm. And it was remarkable to see you know, especially from your from your reporting, just how diplomatic he was working his way through. How do you think that that was, was it his personality? Was it really that he was just that pragmatic Well, person? he was some kind of a charming guy. Yeah. There's no question. I mean, people adored him, you know. When he was a little boy, he was so cute, they called him Cupid, you know. Unfortunately, <laughs> that was a, a nickname that was hard to shake. Right. And when, you know, and, but he had this, he was a celebrity. He was a celebrity all over the world. One of the things when I set out to, to, to research on him, um, I thought, well, you know, I'll find a few dozen articles. I found hundreds and hundreds of articles. I mean, there was a From thousand. All over, the place. all over, all yeah. over, all over. People all over the world were fascinated with him. And he, um, and he got a lot of coverage. In places like Kansas, you know, uh, people found him fascinating. Um, his exploits in the Boer War, um, his personal charm, his his uh, his good fighting ability. He was a good boxer, but he was also really good at Hawaiian wrestling yeah. too. Right. Um, so he had a um, he was very engaged with the outside world. He was very intelligent um, and uh, very open to new ideas. You know, so one of the things that's very interesting when you look at the photographs of him driving around in a car. Right. You know, so he was he adapted to new technology very easily. He found that fascinating. And he was friends with a lot of people who were scholars in Washington. So he um, was sort of up, up on new technology, too. Um, he also had that wonderful Hawaiian quality of being able to connect with people on all levels of society. So people said afterwards, you know, of course, he was so well known in Congress. People loved him. They called him Cupid. They called him the prince. The other congressmen called him the prince. Right. Um, But he was also beloved by, like, uh, regular uh, workers in, in Washington, too. And when he died, there was grief for him, not just among, you know, the the dignitaries of Washington, but also all the average people who had known him and loved him. Right. He had such a remarkable legacy, and it still exists. You know, there's so many street names well, and highways and Kalani Aneole. Yeah. Anything that you see with that, mm-hmm. that's him. Kuhio, mm-hmm. that's him. And Pi'ikoi, mm-hmm. that's his father. Yeah. So those names are all over. Right. Well, thank you so much for sharing these remarkable Mo'olo, these stories about, you know, Prince Kuhio Kalani Aniwole. It's a, you know, such a special series that you produced. And I encourage everyone to take the time and to visit civilbeat.org to see them. Thank you so much. Mahalo and aloha, aloha, aloha. Kama'aina. <laughs> thank you. Mahalo, yeah. noila.